Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Dr. Mario, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, my name is Yun Ti and I manage the SLX Clear Aligners and Carry Motion in Henry Schein, Singapore. First of all, I would like to thank everyone for taking your time to join us today for this Advancing Clear Aligner Therapy webinar. This webinar will also be recorded and available on our website about a week after this at henryshineauthocom slash webinars. During this webinar, if you have any questions, please type them down in the questions box and we will be using the last 30 minutes to answer any questions that you may have. The program of this webinar will cover the mechanics and clinical applications of carrier motion 3D appliance, introduce the benefits and unique advantages of SLX aligner system, describe the rationale for minimal to no attachments with this advanced technology, discuss a range of clinical case types from everyday patients to more challenging cases and demonstrate the step-by-step -step process for submitting SLX aligners on our DDX portal. I will go ahead to introduce our speaker for today. He is Dr. Mario Chorek. Dr. Chorek received his dental degree from University of Kentucky College of Dentistry and earned his certificate of orthodontics and dental facial orthopedics from Oregon Health Sciences University. Throughout his education, he received numerous honors and awards for excellence and academic achievement, including being a finalist for both the American and International Heaven Awards in Dental Research. He has served as a secretary Vice President and President of Washington State Society of Orthodontists. Dr. Chorak has also published articles for American Association of Dental Research, the Journal of Clinical Virology, and Orthodontic, Orthodontic Perspectives Innova. He has lectured on and was a focus group member for self-ligating braces and class two characters. He is currently practicing at his clinics at Renton and Merker Island, Washington. Okay, without further ado, I would like to hand over this to our speaker for today, Dr. Barry Chorek, who will start the presentation. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. I appreciate um, uh, being able to uh, get up very early this morning and uh, give a wonderful presentation on SLX clear liners um, and uh, the uh, mechanics that we use with the uh, with the motion um, appliance carrier motion appliance. So we're going to go through this. We're going to go through um, basically go through some things here on the motion appliance and the SLX aligners. So when we look at that. We're going to talk about um, three things here. We're going to talk about the fit, the trim, and the material that we use here with the SLX um, aligners. So when we talk about number of attachments and why we need those things, we're going to look at these three things individually. And when we look at the fit, um, one of the things that we have need to realize is that um, a lot of times when we look at other um, aligners, we we do 3D printing, and when we do that, um, we lose the uh, the loss of fide, uh, fidelity during that process. So that's the exactness of, of the way something is copied or reproduced. So what happens is when we do when we do that, we lose that exactness and that uh, the way we copy it and the way it's printed out there. So so when we look at that, we got to really pay attention to that um, and how the, the aligner fits to that model. Um, traditional thermoforming process. So sometimes we get the uh, the way the aligner is made on the model. We'll get gapping around the teeth. And that's what that thermal imaging is there. All the, all the red and the blue you see there, that's basically gapping, the gap tolerance between the aligner and the model. And then we're gonna look at things like trim. So we look at uh, the trim and we look at where that scalloping occurs. If it's below the gingival margin, then it basically it doesn't allow a purchase point over the tooth. So we're gonna talk about why aligners can slip um, when we don't have the aligner extending up above that gingival margin. And then we're gonna talk about material. So when we look at the material, we're going to look at things like, you know, is the material stiff enough? Is it too flimsy? Um, when the material isn't stiff enough and it is flimsy, it does require an attachment. So we're going to look at those three things. 
So when people ask, you know, why do you have more attachments? Why does that occur? That really occurs because of those three things. So we look at how we fabricate. So one thing that we look at is we take a very, very, very highly accurate mold. We'll do a scan. We'll send that off to Henry Shine Orthodontics, and they'll produce an exact mold of the tooth. So it's this perfect mold that we use throughout the entire process. So we have a very accurate model of the tooth. And then what we do is we have our proprietary process of how we move the teeth. And basically it mimics and it records the biological tooth movements of the teeth. So we don't lose that, we don't have that loss of fidelity throughout that process. And my understanding that it's moved robotically as well. So the teeth are moved physically and not digitally. And then we also have a proprietary thermoforming process. So the way the aligner is made, it's basically you get a little bit of movement and then the aligner is made and then you get a little bit of movement and then the aligner is made. So you, you really get a very, very nice capturing of the hard and soft tissues um, um, when, we, when we do this thermoforming process. And then if we took the aligner fit and we compare those things, we'll take a look and we'll see that we have a very um, loose fitting aligner on the left there that we talked about before that where you see a very dark blue and that very um, kind of very uh, reddish color. That's where we have a huge, huge gap tolerance there. And then the SLX aligner on the right, you can kind of see we've got the yellow and the kind of the turquoisey blue, which we get a very exact fit. So when that gap tolerance, you know, we're, the SLX aligner, you're looking at maybe um, a thickness of a, of a hair. So, so very, very, very uh, form fitting. And, and that really makes a huge difference of the way the teeth move and also makes a huge difference on um, not creating these lateral open bites that we usually get with Invisalign. And then if we look at the optimized trim, so we take a look on the left there, um, that's the leading brand. We look at like Invisalign, we'll see that we get that slippage. It does not go all the way up to the gingival margin. The SLX liner, we get that a liner going all the way to the top of that gingival margin so we get a better hold, better fit, uh, grabs onto that very, you know, the heart, all of the hard tissue of the tooth. And then we also capture some of that soft tissue. So when we look at the optimized trim there, we can kind of see the arrows that are pointing there. So you can kind of see the, the aligner is going all the way up to the gingival margin. So it's engaging the top of the tooth. So we get less slippage. Um, we incorporate more of the surface area of the tooth. And then if you look at the interproximal soft tissue area there, that, that gingival embrasure, you can kind of see we're capturing more of the hard and soft tissue. And that's really one of the reasons why we don't require a lot of attachments, sometimes none at all, to get these movements to occur. We look at the material, um, we look at the beauty and the strength here. So um, the biggest thing is you can feel the difference between the different uh, liners. Um, you know, the SLX liner is very smooth, it's very hand polished there, so the margins are very smooth. Uh, the difference in, in the way um, the translucency of the aligner, it's very, very, very crystal clear. So um, people really, really hardly notice that you're wearing this aligner. I have so many adult female patients in my community that, that are in this aligner. They love it. Um, and then the staining. Yeah, that's another thing. I've never seen any of my patients um, produce any staining with these aligners. So incredible, beautiful aligner where we see less staining. So if we take a look at the attachment revolution, so we talked about these steps here, the exceptional fit, so that the capturing of all the hard and soft tissue, the optimized trim that we talked about, you know, the aligner going all the way up to the gingival margin and then incorporating the soft tissue, the interproximal, and the gingival embrasure between the teeth. Um, so definitely, you know, by incorporating that extra surface area, we're definitely getting um, less attachments or no attachments um, when we go through this process. The clear wear material. So you get the precise force levels delivered to the teeth and you get that very, very, very nice um, look as well. When we look at the crystal clear, the clear wear material, guarantee not to stain. And then we talked about the silky smooth edges. So we don't get those knife edges that you get with Invisalign that when you laser cut, these are actually hand polished. So very smooth, even though it's incorporating some of the gingival margin, very smooth to the patient. So the key takeaways when we look at that, we look at the increased interdental coverage, we have right there we can kind of see that we're talking about and that coverage is not only talking about the buccal and facial aspects um, of the teeth but also the occlusal aspects of the teeth so we get a very very nice fit the trim we talked about the improved inter interproximal contact so basically the spacing between the two teeth um, get capturing that um, gingival embrasure 
And then we talk about the material, you know, the translucency, the transparency that we get, the resistance and staining. So very, very, very clear aligner. And for those reasons, uh, you know, less reliant on attachments. So we're gonna take a look briefly at the Studio Pro, the SLX Studio Pro. And what this is, is basically when you submit a case, um, the lab technicians at Henry Schein, which are amazing technicians, what they're gonna do is they're gonna send you back a um, case review. And it's basically, the case review is our clin check. And what we do is we get this back and we are going to get a before and after of determining how the teeth are gonna move. Um, we're gonna get staging, so we're gonna see how the teeth are moving. And then we're gonna be able to modify the teeth um, three-dimensionally. So when we take a look here, we're gonna get the teeth back. You're gonna have you know, a portion of the root showing there. We're gonna be able to um, translate the tooth in three-dimensional spaces. So we can intrude, extrude, we can tip, um, we can do all those, all those um, translation movements. We can go in and out with the tooth as well. Um, or we can rotate the, the tooth in three dimensions. So we can rotate it bodily in all three planes of space. So if we want to torque it, if we want to rotate it, we can do all those things as well. And then we also can, um, we can ask for, if we have a very deep overbite case, we can ask for um, hard occlusal contacts in the posterior, light occlusal contacts in the anterior to get that curve of speed level. Um, if we have an open bite case, we can ask for um, red, uh, you know, hard red contacts in the anterior when we finish the case and lighter contacts in the posterior. So we have that capability of asking the technicians all that. Um, and the one thing I will say, the technicians here at Henry Schein, I mean, they really follow the doctor's protocols and, and advice on, on how to set the case up. Um, very rarely do I use much of the Studio Pro to move the teeth. You have the capability of doing that. Um, if you feel like you want a little bit more torque um, on teeth, you're able to do those things. And like I said, we'll show you a little bit later here in the presentation how I do that. So first thing we're going to do is we are going to show you how we submit um, an SLX liner case. So if we look at um, this first screen here, this is the, uh, the homepage um, for SLX Clear Aligners. You'll see right there, homepage, slxclearaligners.com. Um, and I always bring everything up in usually Google Chrome. Um, it just seems to translate a little bit better in Google Chrome. But we're gonna show you a little video here. I'm gonna kind of walk through it, um, basically uh, case by case, or excuse me, a step-by-step -step, uh, solution on how to submit the SLX aligners. So if we take a look here, um, so this is the home page here. It kind of goes back and forth between these two images. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to just go to the drop down menu here. Um, kind of see here, and we're going to go to uh, the S. So you can kind of see these are the two Chrome things that I have up there. I also have an iTero scanner, so I'll show you how we transport a scan. We'll basically go through a home page here. We're going to go. Um, you have all these resources, marketing toolkits. We're going to go to the DDX um, SLX portal. We're going to click on that. This page is going to come up. Um, this is my email address, uh, toothtwist.comcast.net. That's my private email. Um, you're always welcome to uh, give me a shout out on a case if you need some help with, with submission or anything like that. Um, you can share that. And then we create a password. And then once we've got that there, um, we basically, we're going to just click log in. I have this on every computer station in my office. So Every terminal in my office has this, so the assistants can bring a case up. We can see how the case is tracking. We can see if any IPR needs to be done. Um, we can look at, we can assess uh, which two movements are occurring um, throughout the process. So that is literally on every computer screen. And then when we look at right here, we'll go um, everything right here. You can look at um, the uh, cases, finances. Um, you look at a uh, new case, you can look at what's coming in at, um, during the month. If there's an open case where maybe we haven't finished um, submitting the case, you look at finances here. If you, um, you know, if there's something due, you can check that out. Um, you can go to the, the, the portal right here. So you have alerts. You can look at all the alerts. Um, you can see um, you know, with the COVID thing, we've got a few cases that are running behind. But um, here in Seattle, we aren't seeing patients yet, so uh, not a problem getting all my aligners in on time. So we'll be ready to roll once we're um, back and, and operational. And you kind of see there's a draft there on that left side. So when we're looking at that, sometimes when we're, we may be busy, we may um, have gotten very, very close to submitting the case, but, um, but we didn't quite submit it yet because one of our assistants called us over and said, hey, Dr. Torek, I need you in chair two. So we'll just save that. So, so here, just bringing a case up because I had an alert. I'll take a look at the notes. 
So I basically will go through, looks like I asked for some attachments there. So everything looks good, I'll click out of there. And then when we look at that, we can look at, um, we can look at calendar, we can see which cases are coming in um, on a day-by-day -day basis, if they've arrived, if they're late. So we have the uh, capability of doing that. We can look at the activity log. So we can see you know, which cases were done on which day. Um, so we can take a look at that. We have the capability of doing that. Um, so, and that comes up, you can take a look at that on a daily basis. You know, let's see, and then drafts, like we talked about there, if you need to save a draft. And then we have a search icon over here. So you can go in here, you can search, you can just type in a patient's name, that patient will appear. Um, and then, like I said, you can click on, on their images and, and you can look at, um, like I said, you look at IPR, you can look at all these cases. Um, there you have new case, new submission. My account, so you can add an account. If you have another doctor, you want to add them on there, you have the capability of doing that. Um, over here, you can have patients. You can look at all patients there. If you click on that icon, all patients will appear. Um, tag cases, basically different users. Like I said, if you want um, a staff member to be able to access it and have their own you know, security codes and stuff like that, you can do that as well. And I think we're going to do, just here in a second, we're going to do a case submission. Yeah, so what we're going to do, so we're going to basically go back up here, new task. We're going to go new case. And here we are. So we're going to submit a case. And usually a provider usually pops in there. We're going to just type in a name here. And the thing is, is that, um, you know, for, uh, I, I basically wanted to really kind of dive in because I know some people are uh, initial users or haven't used the pro process yet, but it's very, very easy once you get the hang of it. Um, it's literally just type in the names, you know, gender, patient chart you don't have to worry about um, because it's going to register with the birth date here. Um, but basically you have a drop down menu for the month, the day, the year. Very, very easy once you get the hang of it. Just like with anything new, you know, it takes a couple steps just to figure it out. So when we get there, then we're going to go to procedure here. So we're going to go to procedure. We're going to go SLX clear aligners. We're going to click on that. And then you have this drop down menu that comes up and we're able to look at treatment steps. So we can look at treatment steps. You can kind of see I have a heart there. So that's basically my favorite. If you click on there and that heart appears, it kind of saves it as your favorite. So I usually like the lab to recommend. Um, you have the capability of, you can look at the drop down, you can do an express, a full, a lab may recommend, you can do a light. You can kind of see the different series there. Express is one through 10, full treatments, 21 through 30, and then light treatment 11 to 20. I usually like to have the lab recommend just because I know that they're gonna give me the best outcome um, on how many aligners it'll take to, to treat the case. Digital impression type. I like I said, we have a we have a um, digital impression, but you can submit a PBS um, arches to treat. We have that capability as well to treat. Um, so you can kind of see I just uh, highlighted that, but we have the capability of treating both arches, upper and lower arch. Obviously, both arches. I like to treat both arches. And then if we go to the right here, we can kind of see we have. Um, sets of retainers. So you can have one set's always included with the product, um, but we have the capability of getting more. We can get two sets, one set, all depends on, I think the patient's going to be responsible. Um, parents appreciate it. Uh, you know, if we have the capability of giving them an extra set of retainers, we have that capability of doing that. I like that fact that the product does come with a set of retainers. It's very nice. Uh, treatment limitations, so we can do, I usually will say none, full arch, but we have the ability to do three to three, five to five, um, full arch except the third molars. So we can always um, uh, explain that to the technician on what we're, what we're trying to accomplish here. I usually like to just have the uh, none, just full arch treatment. So if we take a look here, we have those all those capabilities, but full arch treatment and third molars is kind of one of those things that I don't really incorporate um, into um, the SLX appliance there, just because I think if you get 
too far back, sometimes you can get a little bit of a gag reflex. So, so those are the things. Um, where we want the aligner to stop, um, I usually say do not include um, third molars, but we can trim it to the mesial of the second molars. Um, we can incorporate all the second molars, you know, if we need um, anchorage back there. So we have that capability to tell the technicians where we want the aligners to end. And a lot of that's going to also depend, determine on how much of the scan that you get back there. You know, sometimes patients, it's a little bit hard to, to get all the way back there and take a scan of those third molars. So this is a really um, important, uh, the primary concern. We want to make sure we address the patient's primary concern. Um, this patient did not like um, her anterior crossbite and her, uh, and her open bite. So we're going to write that. Uh, if there's any parafunctional habits, bruxism, you know, digit sucking, tongue thrust, anything like that, we're going to write that there. I believe this patient had a little bit of a tongue thrust. Midline, I basically say optimize. Um, usually they do a wonderful job at that. However, if the, you know, upper is on with the face, we will we'll get the lower to optimize the upper arch form. So arch form is an important one. Um, I'm a big self-ligation um, type of treatment planning. So I usually like to broaden my arches out. Um, so I usually will do, um, but you have the ability to constrict um, arch forms if you feel like they're too expanded or have a um, kind of a scissors bite. But I'll usually will do a gradual expansion. So that's that two millimeters in the uh, premolar area of expansion, then one millimeter in the posterior. That's the one I usually will default to. But if you uh, if we need some patient wants some um, you know, more expansion, we have the uh, ability to do that broad arch form, which uh, may require more than uh, two plus millimeters. So, so we're able to give the technicians a lot with a minimal amount of effort um, with the drop down menu. If we take a look here at overjet overbite, um, I usually will optimize um, all the time, except if I have a very, very, very deep overbite, um, sometimes we'll, we'll be able to um, do some slight, slight over engineering um, and ask for a little bit more but that's usually, um, or, or an open bite, you know, but the technicians are pretty darn good of, of giving you what uh, what you ask for, if you're asking for it there uh, properly. So that's kind of what that improved four millimeters there. So that you have capability of, of doing that, which is great. Cross bite, um, as you will say, optimize. Um, and uh, that's a wonderful thing. If you if you do have some cross bites or cross bite tendencies, we are able to really get that eliminated with aligners. Um, sometimes we do a cross arch elastic, sometimes we're just able to do it with the aligners themselves. And then the optimize, you know, we can kind of see we have uh, class one optimization right and left. Um, this is a new feature here. So if we did any um, motion uh, prior to the SLX aligners, we're able to tell the technicians that. Um, IPR. So um, IPR has come a long way. We're able to do it at the beginning of treatment, we're at, you know, let's say stage four or three. Um, basically uh, before stage one. So we're able to kind of really highlight when we want the IPR done. Um, I do like the, uh, the one of the features there is like when the, when the first contact becomes accessible. So sometimes they'll line the teeth up so we don't have to do any TPN or, or any, um, uh, you know, removal of enamel, uh, excess enamel. If we, if once the teeth are lined up, sometimes it's a little easier to do that. So I usually will sometimes pick that feature. Sometimes I'll do it at the beginning. It just depends on the case. Um, so you, you know, doctor will provide schedule and preferences. You have the ability of that, or you can do no IPR. So I mean, that's always a, you know, a, a thing. I usually will kind of um, designate my IPR in the anterior, um, like I said, case by case basis. But you have the ability to give the lab technicians as much information as you want there. Um, and then you can des, uh, determine the amount of IPR. So you can do 0.3 per contact, 0.2. Um, I, like I said, I like the 0.3. The difference, the biggest difference with SLX aligners is if you request IPR or if the technicians give you IPR, um, unlike Invisalign, you have to perform the IPR or the aligners will, will push on the teeth in a way that's not favorable. So, so it's a little bit different. If, um, if they ask for IPR, um, you're gonna have to perform some IPR. So this tooth spacing, crowding, and re resolution lab may recommend. So there's a couple of different features on how, how you um, correct that. And then basically what's showing there is basically you have the ability to, um, to expand. You have the ability to, um, to do IPR, or you have uh, the ability to procline the incisors. So, so those are the three different ways that you can actually um, move the teeth. 
so per se. So that's one that I, I took a little bit of time there explaining that. So, or you can extract teeth. I mean, that's also, uh, I don't, I'm not a big extractionist, so I don't really like to do a lot of extraction, but that's kind of one of the ways they do there. Contacts, we talked about that before. We can ask for heavy contacts in the posterior. Um, if we're to do a uh, deep bite correction, deep overbite correction, um, and then light contacts in the anterior, or if we have an open bite, we can just ask the, just the opposite. So um, we can do heavy contacts in the anterior, light contacts in the posterior. Um, that's kind of what that's showing there. So we can ask the technicians to do that for us. Um, don't have to do that as much as I used to have to do with Invisalign. So that's one thing that I'm, I'm really, um, and that's really because of the fit of the aligner over the teeth there. And you'll see that on the when we start showing some treatments. Uh, attachment types. So I usually will um, ask um, for uh, attachments during the entire treatment. I like to get everything done initially when we're delivering the aligners. Um, that way we're able to put the patient out a little bit further um, and uh, they don't have to come in for appointments that are going to take um, uh, more time away. And then we can ask for movement velocity. So if we want the teeth moving a little bit faster, we have the capability of doing that. Um, I like to just default um, to the one degree tip, um, two degrees of rotation and and, uh, and uh, one degree of torque and then the 0.25 millimeters um, of movement uh, per tray. That's kind of what I usually like to default to. Um, but if you have a case that uh, has minor, minor crowding and um, isn't all that excessive, then you may be able to increase the velocity. But I usually, I like to let the lab technician kind of make that decision. And then at the end of um, treatment, if we think we might need a refinement, I usually like to add two sets of passive aligners at the end just to give the patient some aligners. They feel like they're still going through treatment. Um, but we're holding teeth in place until we get uh, until we get the refinement in. One thing I love about the SLX clear liners is, um, you know, it's not like three, four refinements. I mean, basically, it's uh, they're very laser focused on trying to get that optimal result the very first time. Um, versus like with Invisalign, like you'll get it halfway done, and then you'll get it another halfway done, and then you get another halfway done, and then you finally get it done. So this, um, we have some charts here where basically um, we can indicate um, which teeth we don't want to move. So if we have an implant or a bridge and we want to indicate to the technicians we don't want to move those teeth, we have the capability of doing that. And that's what this is showing right here. So we have the capability of just clicking on the tooth and it will kind of basically tell um, the technician that that's an implant and or we just do not want to move that tooth. So that's nice that you're able to select that. And then we also have the ability to ask for cutouts. So if we have a patient who have had, who's had motion, whether it's a class um, two or class three motion, what I do is when I submit my case, I'll leave um, my Kaplan hooks or my sidekicks on there and they will um, automatically um, punch those out for us. But you, we, we can indicate here which teeth we want punched out. Um, and then we also have the capability of doing elastic slits. So, um, you know, for uh, class two correction, you know, post uh, motion, or even if we have a little bit of a class two that we don't want to use motion on, we, we have the capability of asking for slits and cutouts on those teeth. And that's kind of what that's showing there. It's nice having a universal guide there where you can actually see the teeth um, and, and make those decisions. Um, and a lot of times they'll um, they'll kind of auto um, uh, they'll auto save in the area. So if you've clicked on um, let's say tooth number three and fourteen, upper sixes or lower sixes, it will it will kind of sometimes um, save save in there as well. Every time you click, it'll show in there. Um, and then we, if we want to move teeth as a group, let's say we want to do some anterior intru uh, intrusion there on the lower arch, we can click on those teeth. Lab technicians know that we want to intrude all those teeth as a group. Same thing on the upper. If we have um, uh, teeth that have over erupted and we have a gummy smile and we want to um, we want to help that smile arc, we're, we're able to do that as well. And then if we want to extract teeth. So if we have teeth that we're going to extract, we can indicate those, um, which teeth those are. And a lab technician knows not to include those. 
and then we can uh, have the ability to go to no IPR as well. So there's uh, there's something there that we basically um, teeth that we don't want to do IPR on. We have the capability of dropping down there and clicking on that too. So we're going to show you how we're going to submit the scan and the pictures here. So what I usually will do is you can kind of see we're going to upload case file. So you can kind of see on my desktop I have a folder there. Um, I have Edge right there, which is my um, imaging software and, and my office management software. So I basically will bring the pictures up. I'll highlight the pictures and uh, the pictures that I want there. And then what we'll do is we'll export. You can kind of see in my software, it's just an export. We click on that. We'll export the images. So we'll kind of see there, we'll just click on that. All those images will export. And they'll export, we'll pick a file. So you'll kind of see, we'll export the images. And you kind of see we have a, just a drop down menu there. And then we'll just click select folder. And all those images will populate in that folder. So when we take a look at that, and we'll minimize out of here. So all those images are now in that folder. So I'll just click on that. We'll click um, patient's last name here, just abbreviated there. So here she is. So I'm just going to click. It's just controls. Click on the mouse. You click all those on there. Very easy. So you don't have to drop it into an actual. Um, you know, pre pre um, set composite folder or anything like that. Technicians just want to have the images. Um, you can kind of say we have a uh, X-ray included, and then what we'll do is I'm just going to drag those all in there, and they're going to just populate in there. Super easy. Just click OK. Sometimes you'll get that. Um, just click it OK, and you'll see all these things will just auto populate in there. Super easy. Um, there they go. So you can kind of see everything's being populated in there. Um, all the images are there. Perfect. I'll just click out of that. And then, like I said, on Google Chrome, we're going to see here. Well, there you see. So all the images are there. So we got everything there. This is a case I'm going to show you guys a little bit later, but I just wanted to show you how we... Um, present that case. Now we're going to go and now I have my iTero um, website up. So it's myitero.com. I've got the patient searched for her right there. So you can kind of see we've got that. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on uh, Josephine's name here. Very easy. And I have both offices on here. Sometimes there's a drop down menu to bring up which office you're at. So you go to export. Super easy. Click on export, and you're going to see it's going to give you options on, on how we want that file to be exported. So you click on export, export type, you're going to click on solid model with low profile base, and then you're going to click on um, file per arch oriented and inclusion, and then you're going to export it. So super easy. It's going to start populating. It's going to create a zip file. You can kind of see right there, it's showing that it's 1% um, preparing the file. And this happens pretty darn quickly. We're going to minimize it. Um, and I'm going to keep working on how I want to um, submit the case. We're going to go. So I'm going to basically just move that guy over. I'm going to bring up my DDX platform here. I'm going to minimize that. And I'm going to start typing in some things. Just want to show you. So I do a lot of multitasking when I'm doing my case submission, but I wanted to kind of show you in the, in the full screen kind of what we're doing here. But basically, we're we're going to let that kind of download there. You can kind of see it's at 21% now. Um, I'm double checking, making sure I have all my images, and then I'm just going to start typing some notes for the for the technicians um, how I want the case to 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 treat. Obviously, you can kind of see with Josephine there, we've got uh, an open bite that we need to close. Um, she's gone through some class three um, motion correction there. And then, yeah, I don't know if you saw that, but that the lower left window, you kind of see that OrthoCAD export zip file. So that's all loaded now. So the super easiest way is to just click. We're going to show you. You're just going to click on this, and you're going to drag it to where your images are. You're going to see. There we go. 
and there we go. So we dropped the scan in there. So now all the files um, for a case submission have all been submitted. So we've got everything in there. We've got the images. You can kind of see the, uh, the zip files loading. So it's super easy. It's going to be done here in a second. Um, so you can kind of see right there, we've got, you know, zip updated. So there we go. So that's all loaded. So I'm clicking out of this and, and we're done loading all the records now. So here we are, we've got the uh, the images, we've got the scan, everything the technicians need now um, to uh, give you a, a case review and work up your case for you. And then we're just gonna type in some notes. So I'm just gonna give the technicians, I usually do about, it just depends on, on how difficult the case is and what we're looking at, um, but I'm gonna basically give them um, some information on how I want the teeth to line up from a torque standpoint, from an overbite, um, standpoint um, from an alignment standpoint but some very very generic messaging here a lot of the information i've already given them in the ddx platform on those drop down menus um, but i'm just going to type in a few things that you know i want to establish ideal overbite overjet um, create um, uh, you know an, an ideal overbite overjet um, you know get the teeth to line up so very very minor things and um, at the end of the presentation here, you're going to see how this case turned out. We're going to share this one with you. But I don't spend a lot of time. I give them information. Um, you know, a lot of times here, if I have an open bite case, I might say, you know, give me an ideal overbite of three millimeters instead of two, um, just so they have an understanding that we're really trying to maybe overcorrect this bite. We look at her smile arc right she's got a little bit of a reverse smile arc we want to improve that so those are some of the things that you know we're going to mention to the technicians um obviously they can see that she's had a class three motion so and we've already indicated that in the drop down menu um but basically um and when i look at a case here we've created a lot of room for for her crowding um i don't think i'm going to need a lot of ipr uh, on her case so i said you know provide minimal ipr if necessary um but that's really kind of uh, you know how we do that typing in some few things there and then when we take a look at the lower right so we'll have i accept all terms and conditions we click that and then we have two options there we have um submit the case um on the lower right there and we're just kind of just going back here and looking at um you know do we have all the records is everything there um we go back up so you know I always say thank you. Um, I really, uh, like I said, the technicians here are absolutely amazing. They do a great job of setting these cases up. Um, very, very little effort and need um, to change things. Um, yeah, so you kind of see I'm asking them to upright those lower incisors. You can say torque if you want. Um, a lot of times I just use very, um, uh, you know, very down to down to earth verbiage when it comes to stuff like that. But you can get very precise too. Um, if you ask for 10 degrees or 15 degrees or 20 degrees, um, they'll provide it. I, I really find that we don't have to do a lot of over engineering um, with the SLX aligners. Um, so the technicians, if they give you a really nice setup, that's one thing that I found out we don't have to do a lot of over engineering. So, so if we take a look at here, you can kind of see on that lower right, we're able to um, accept it kind of click there and then let's say we're talking about you know if we're busy and we don't have a chance to hit the submit case we can almost save the draft so you have the ability to do um you know submit case or save draft so so that's really kind of when we look at how to submit um an slx um you know a liner case that's really what it comes down to you hit the uh, submit button and it'll give you an id and it'll say that case is under review and uh so that's kind of you know that's really kind of how simple it can be um so now we're going to get into um we're going to get into some slx clear aligner cases so um so first case very simple case um very very simple case kristen came in um had a lower three three on came off um she noticed that her teeth were shifting a little bit on the lower um, she didn't like her upper uh, central incisors. She just felt like they've over upped a little bit, and they had. So I told her, you know, we got this great um, new aligner system in. Um, she was sold on it. All these cases that you're going to see here, 
especially with Kristen, um, literally no um, attachments. So when we look at Kristen's case here, nice alignment on the upper arch. You know, we're able to get a little bit better um, CEJ uh, alignment between the upper ones and threes. Lower arch um, lined up really fast, you know, 10 trays. Um, very, very easy case, uh, took four months. So, so, yeah, she was super happy. Uh, we ended up doing, um, uh, basically, uh, on her lower aligner, I just relieved the area there for the lower 3 3. And uh, she um, has the SLX aligner, uh, excuse me, SLX retainers on right now. So, she's very happy. Super, super easy case. So, some of these minor relapse cases, um, you know, um, as a starting point, great, great, great um, appliance to use on your patients. A little different case here. So here we have Andrew comes in, um, has some spacing in the anterior, and you'll see here in a second, he's got some retroclined incisors and really, really um, kind of a caved in posterior dentition as well. Let me take a look at his upper arch. You can kind of see we have the upper crowding there. We have the retroclined incisors. Um, on the lower, you can kind of say we got the lower crowding. Um, the one thing that I always look at when I'm looking at how do we how do we relieve the crowding, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, is when we have that amazing buckle bone support, what we're looking at there is really, really capturing um, and using that buckle bone support to help line those teeth up. And that's kind of what we're looking here with Andrew. This is where the original Studio Pro started, right here. So. This is an Adobe Acrobat um, software here, and basically this is what we would get back originally um, um, with Studio Pro. So we would basically get an image like this, and we'd show before and after, and we'd see how the teeth would move. It's come a long way since. So four months into treatment, we take a look here. Um, Andrew's bite's closing up very, very, very nicely. Um, you can kind of see no impingement of that upper um, gingiva. That's one thing that aligners does such a great job of is it really controls that tissue from getting impinged in that area. Um, so we're getting some nice overbite correction. We're getting some nice uprighting of the teeth. We take a look here at Andrew. You kind of see we're filling in that buccal corridor spacing. We're really utilizing that buccal bone support of his to help alleviate the crowding, but also uprighting that curve of Wilson. Six months, you can see we're starting to get that expansion. We're starting to get that uprighting. Um, his teeth are looking great. Everything's tracking very, very well. Um, you know, I have about 100 and right around 130, 150 cases with the SLX liners and really don't have much issue with tracking. Um, the way that the, the thermoforming process, how it fits over the teeth, not only at the buccal, um, kind of the buccal lingual, but over the occlusal aspect of the teeth. And we're going to show you, I'm going to really highlight that you know, as we start showing these cases. But we look at the teeth, you know, the teeth are detorquing in the anterior, the alignment's looking great. Like I said, we're using that buccal bone support to help expand those arches. So here we are seven months into treatment and Andrew's ready for a refinement. And we look at the, uh, the alignment, arch expansion. Things are looking really good. Where we started, where we're at right here. So 21 total aligners, seven months. So when we look at the images there where we started, and especially look at the upper occlusal, you can see we definitely got some expansion in those arches. We definitely got torque um, expression on those upper incisors. Even on that lower, if you look at that lower um, right, um, excuse me, lower left one, look at the way that that tooth torqued into place as well without torquing attachments, right? We all love those torquing attachments. Well, we don't need torquing attachments with SLX clear aligners. You know, since it grips the tooth more, we're able to get that movement to occur. So take a look at how well those arches have lined up, seven months. So we submit for refinement, and this is what I get back from, from the lab. Now, this is when we first were able to start using attachments with the product, and I really wanted to see if I could get a little bit more of lower incisor intrusion. So this is what the lab set up for me. You'll see we have two attachments on the lower threes, We'll take a look here. You'll see before, after. So here we are before, after. You'll see all these images will be before, after. So I'm asking for a little bit more um, facial crown torque um, in the anterior there. So you see that they're gonna provide that for me. Um, and I'm asking for a little bit more expanding of the arches there, a little bit more uprighting that posterior dentition. And if we take a look at the lower arch, we're just getting a little bit more alignment of those lower threes, but we're also asking for some intrusion. Then you kind of see the 
upper incisors are torquing, getting a little bit more expansion as well. That's where his. Uh, that's what we're asking for. Andrew's um, just about done with this whole COVID-19 thing. Um, a lot of these patients are, are pretty much done. I just don't have final photos on them, but um, he's treated out really nicely, and we're looking at about a year of treatment. So, Alexandra, a little bit, a little bit more uh, different when it comes to crowding and, and torquing. But if we look at the lower um, incisors, you can kind of see we've got some crowding down there. Uh, lower incisors are also slightly procline, and then on the upper, we've got those upper ones that are retrocline. Same thing. She's got great lateral bone support, so we're going to use that to help alleviate the crowding. Um, so this is what uh, the case review, first case review we got. This is what it showed. Same thing. Initially, no attachments to her case. Um, most of the cases that you're going to see here, um, we did not have the ability uh, to place attachments or ask for attachments, um, but now you can. And I'm going to talk a little bit about when we get to a case that has attachments, where I usually ask for attachments. But you can kind of see those are the before and afters. You can kind of see does a wonderful job of uprighting the teeth, getting that torque established. And then a little bit of IPR here for uh, Alexandra, just 0.3 per contact on the lower arch. And she has pretty fan-shaped lower incisors. So after five months, this is where we got with her. Um, you can kind of see we've got some really, really nice alignment going on. Upper ones, you can kind of see we're detorqued. Lower incisors, not only do I like the alignment, but if you can take a look there, we've got some really nice uprighting of those lower teeth. So we take a look at the before on top and the after. So look at how those lower teeth have been not only lined up, but we've actually got some really nice uprighting of those lower incisors. So, like I said, we're able to torque with this product. Get a really, really nice uh, job. Technicians did a great job of lining those teeth up. Here we are before and after. So, like I said, five months of treatment. And here we are right here. One thing I want you to note is the posterior dentition. You kind of see how locked in that posterior dentition is without any attachments on there. So, that's one of the things that I really started to see with my SLX aligner cases. We don't get that traditional posterior open bite um, that we normally get with other brands like Invisalign. I would always have to spend a good three to six months on getting that bite to settle into place. So here she is for her refinement. Now, at this point, we had the ability to get attachments. I didn't like her smile arc all that all that much. I wanted to get a little bit of, uh, a little bit of extrusion on the uh, anterior um, upper three to three. So of course, Somebody who has no attachments and then all of a sudden has some attachments on there, um, you know, she uh, she was not very happy with me. But I explained to her that this is what we wanted to do, and she kind of saw that the fact that her teeth weren't quite touching in front there. So we had that capability of doing that. And she's tracking great. Um, the one thing I love about this product is when you do put an attachment on, the way the material um, adapts to that attachment, it really grips that attachment. So so you don't. So you really get the movement that you want to occur um, very, very fast. So um, you kind of see what we're working on there, just getting a little bit more uh, positive overbite. I did a little bit more IPR on her. Um, like I said, she's just about done with treatment. It's looking great. Huey here um, didn't like his procline incisors. Um, you know, obviously we've got some lower alignment there issues. Um, he has an underlying class three, didn't really pick that up on diagnosis, and you'll see here um, in a second, but um, great patient, wears his aligners, um, you know, fantastic patient. We're going to show you here his case set up here before and after. So you see, I like to go through all right, left, front, back. I really like the back feature because you can actually see how the teeth are going to torque. You're going to be able to see that if you're doing any um, posterior movement, if you're doing any torquing in the posterior there. And with him, you can kind of see he's got those procline incisors. I just asked for the technicians to upright those teeth or place a little bit of crown torque on those. Then go crown torque. And obviously, with some arch expansion, we're going we're gonna to help that too. So we take a look, here we are six months into treatment. He's lining up great, everything looks good. We're getting a little bit of bite opening there on that um, on that left side and that, that right three. Like I said, um, didn't have the capability of placing an attachment on any of these teeth. So this is where we got. 
One thing I want you to notice on that upper right area there where we started to where we were at six months, look how well the upper right six, uh, five and four have lined up without any attachments on those teeth. And look how much upright we got of those upper incisors. So that looks great. Lower alignment looks really good. Just like we talked about, you can kind of see the lower six is how how lingually tipped those teeth were initially and then how much uprighting we got there. Um, like I said, with, with no attachments. So just amazing how well these aligners move the teeth. Now here we are, got a little bit of overbite correction as well, reestablishing those uh, CEJs between the centrals and the canines. And then here we are right here. So, you know, pretty much got nice um, interdigitation. Like I said, a little bit of an underlying class three so we're going to work on that in his refinement. Here we are. So here we are. We got uh, we just did a quick little refinement with the same occlusion. So the nice thing about the software in Studio Pro and how it works now is you'll always get a case review um, when you when you do a refinement. So you'll always get a case review, even if you're asking for the same occlusion. You'll always get um, the lab will always generate a case review for you to to take a look at. Um, initially it didn't, and, and this is what we got with an additional um, 11 aligners. So one thing I really wanted to show this case off here is you can kind of say we have some attachments on those upper threes. And one, one of the reasons why I wanted to show this case is look how much that upper right three that was out of occlusion has moved into occlusion. I really wanted to show you that the product can extrude teeth wonderfully well. Um, and in that case, that's kind of what we got going on. And you look at his lower alignment, looks great. Um, so we're asking for a little bit more. I want to get that bite sucked in on that um, on that left side. So that's kind of what we did here. Now you're going to start seeing how this um, Studio Pro has morphed over time. And you saw where we first started. And now we actually have the capability of doing staging. So when we take a look here, you can kind of see we've got before and after. I always like to still use the before and after just to see how the teeth are moving, um, seeing how things are coming into place. But we now also have the capability of using the staging tool here. And you'll see that in just a sec here. Um, and I like to, what I like to look at when I do the staging tool is just to see how the teeth are moving from a velocity standpoint. Are they moving? Um, as fast as I want? Or are they moving too fast and at what stage? So you're able to give the technician, here we go, we're just going to run through that. You can kind of see, I'm just toggling through there. I'm just seeing, are those teeth moving biologically correctly? Um, if they're moving too fast, I might say to the technician, you know, slow the movement um, of the upper sevens or, um, you know, at stage, you know, 23, I feel like that tooth is moving too quickly. But you have the capability of looking at the teeth now and, and give the technicians a little bit more information if you feel like a tooth is moving too fast. So you have that capability of doing that. Um, you'll see the back. I always like to look at the back. Like I said, it's nice to see, um, like I said, you get a portion of that root to kind of show how the teeth are moving. Um, and then obviously you kind of look upper and lower. So you can kind of see I'm asking for a little bit of uh, torque of those lower incisors. And then on the upper, you kind of see we're working a little bit on those rotations, trying to get those teeth in the idea of getting a little bit of expansion in the posterior as well. So that's looking really good. And then before and after there. So that's what we're asking for. Um, Mew was one of those patients that got caught up in this COVID thing. So he's getting ready to come back and get uh, those additional aligners to finish up. Luca, um, very simple case, minor crowding. A little bit of a deep bite there due to the uh, upper uh, central incisors over erupting. Same thing. Very straightforward case. You can kind of see those teeth lining up there. So a lot of these cases, if you look at that, have very minor crowding, a little bit of bite correction. Um, to me, it's just I always basically try to delineate with the parent and the patient if they feel like they can be compliant and wearing um, the aligners. That's kind of, you know, having those heart-to-heart -heart talks during the initial exams, talking to your patients, because he didn't, I mean, he's a high schooler, he did not want to have braces. And uh, he also wanted something clear. 
Um, so this was the perfect product. We did a little IPR on the lower just to help with that lower alignment. And after six months, you can kind of see teeth are lining up great. <clears throat> We're uprighting those posterior teeth. Um, he's very happy. A little bit of class two on that right side that kind of poked up there. Um, but if we take a look at the alignment, utilization of the buckle bone support that we talked about to get that expansion. And we take a look, we got a little midline discrepancy. We still had it on that uh, before picture there. A lot of times at the end of treatment too, if you see how, you know, we've got those incisal chips, I'll go in there and polish those up um, either with like some composite finishing um, discs or um, we use a, um, a fine diamond. Usually Brazzler sells a, some, a nice fine diamond for those. Looks like a top or a flying saucer. Um, does a really good job on those incisal chips. But you can take a look. A posterior segments holding occlusions holding up nicely. Like I said, a little class two on that right side. And we're going to capture that when we do his refinement. Um, Lisa, another very simple case. I mean, these are out in your waiting room all the time. I treated um, both her daughters. She wanted to get her diastema closed, didn't like that, didn't like her uh, lower spacing. So we talked about that. Um, this is what we got for her. Very, very simple, easy case but very, um, she's very aesthetically driven and uh, she did not want to have 20 attachments on her teeth. You know, that that's one thing I hear all the time is people will say, well, I want my teeth fixed, but I see people that have, you know, um, Invisalign and they've got all these like blocks on their teeth and do I need to have those? And I basically say, no, you don't. Um, you know, we've got this new product, it's so clear and you, you know, you show them and that's how we do our exams. I basically will show them um, kind of what we're looking at. Um, IPR on her, it was a little bit more on the post here. That was just for the midline correction, but I just um, I just basically went in there and lightly dissed those areas. But if we look at um, four months, um, space closed, midline is corrected, alignment looks great. Um, you're going to see a picture here. I want to really highlight on that upper, um, her upper right side. You see that four how rotated that was at the beginning and how much we were able to get that rotation um, corrected and that space closed. And remember, no attachments here. Same thing on that upper right four. Look at how well that the aligner, that SLX aligner engaged that tooth and derotated those teeth. Wonderful. Lower alignment there. You can take a look there. You know, we've got some nice alignment. We've got that space closing on that lower left side there and really getting some nice uprighting of her teeth. There's the frontal there, getting rid of those black triangles, you know, sometimes getting the tooth to uh, the root to upright, you know, doing some minor IPR, you can get rid of that for her. But look at her buccal occlusion too. Look at how well things are socked in. You know, even with expansion, no lateral open bites. So here's her case. We can take a look before and after. Um, kind of see that there. So with her, I asked for a couple of attachments just on those canines, just to help a little bit with the torque, a little bit with the bite leveling there on her. Um, and then just also sometimes, you know, just for slight little bit of retention, but you see how those threes are really want to engage those threes and really kind of upright those threes. That's kind of what I was working on there. But, you know, four attachments versus 20 attachments. I, I love it. And you also see like with adult cases, you know, there's we all have adult cases out there that have all these porcelain fused to metal crowns that are really hard to sometimes get attachments to stay on them. It's wonderful when you have an adult patient, you don't have to put all these attachments on them. And you'll see a few more here. I'm really gonna highlight that. You can kind of see the movement there. So we get to another simple case. This is one of my assistants, Amanda, she's such a sweetheart. Um, you know, didn't like her narrow arches. She had jaw surgery um, when she was an adolescent back in the day, and they also extracted on her. So she just really wanted, um, really wanted that upper right two lined up, and uh, that was kind of, and just didn't like her narrow arches. So this is kind of what we got back from the lab um, before and after. Kind of see she's got a little bit of a tilt there on that upper right one as well. Um, so we're looking at you know, what can we do? Same thing, did not have attachments at this time. Um, so we're working at just getting some nice you know, alignment there on the lower. You'll kind of see we're gonna work on some expansion.
So here she is four months. You can kind of see we're definitely getting some expansion to her arches, really filling in that buccal corridor. So this is the very first, so Amanda was the very first patient that I was able to get attachments on. I really wanted to take a picture to show you what these things will look like um, close up. So you can kind of see they do blend in with the tooth very nicely. Um, that is a, you know, horizontally, um, gingerly beveled attachment. And I usually will do that for extrusion. That's kind of what we got here. That's kind of before or after. So you can kind of see. Now you'll see, um, this is originally how they appeared were basically clear. Now they appear blue, the attachments. So you can kind of see that's what we're working on there. This is where Amanda finished eight months. Um, here she is. Kind of see we've got some blue marking paper, just equilibrating her bite a little bit there. But if we take a look at how much arch broadness we got there, uprighting those canines, really filled in her buckle corridor. Um, got this done before her engagement picture, so she was super happy. Um, and that bite has settled in now. Haley, another simple case, lower crowding, upper right two. She did not like that lateral. Um, same thing, we've got plenty of buckle corridor, um, uh, buckle bone there. We want to really fill in that buckle corridor for her. This is what we got. So very, very simple case, but like I said, no attachments. Things line up really nicely on her. So we take a look here, five months, um, really utilizing the, the buckle bone support. You kind of see the upper right too, lining up nicely, lower crowding, really, really looking good there. A little bit of midline correction that needs to still occur. Get a little bit more uprighting on that lower right one. But like I said, buckle, um, the buckle occlusion looks awesome. Everything's still socked in. And then we're gonna take a look here. Um, so this is where I asked for just a couple of attachments just to kind of get a little bit more um, uprighting those threes. I want to get the um, one to get those seven socked in as well. But you know, like I said, four attachments versus twenty. Love it. And patients like that too. I mean, you know, minimal attachments or no attachments, and you're able to get the teeth to move properly. That's that's you know. I mean, that's a, to me, that's just a selling point in your community. You'll kind of see there, we're just working a little bit on that midline correction there. Bite looks socked in, looks good. Another case here, Rosanna, um, similar situation. I'm going to go through these a little bit quicker so we can get to some tougher cases, but similar case, five months, you can kind of see we've got some spacing that's uh, that's been closed. Same thing, she was getting married. She was so happy that we got that close for her before her wedding. Um, super happy. And here we got a little bit of the class two that popped in there, but we're gonna resolve that. Uh, one attachment, so this is the, her refinement, you know, one attachment there, that's all, that's all that was required. Uh, another case here, Andrea, similar situation, came in for a night guard. I asked her if she wanted her teeth straightened. She said, yeah, absolutely. So went through this here, we'll take a look. So here she is five months, note the alignment, note the reduction in the black triangles. We're gonna work on that. And a lot of times people, if they have this bone loss, it's, usually it's an occlusion thing. And you can kind of see she had minimal overjet. Um, so we reestablished, you know, a nice light contacts there in the anterior for her. It's gonna help her long-term. This is basically her refinement. So you can kind of see no, no black triangles now. And also no attachments. This is her sister-in-law, <laughs> um, similar situation. You know, uh, didn't like the alignment of her upper front teeth, didn't like the rotation of the upper right two. You know, here she is six months. You can kind of see we're getting some nice uprighting in those incisors. The upper right two is moving not as much as I'd like. And then the lower alignment, you can kind of see the teeth are lining up. Looking good. I mean, much, much improved. Um, we're going to work a little bit on that uh, midline correction in her refinement. I was going to work on getting 
those centrals torque a little bit more and get those twos rotated more as well. But posterior occlusion, like we talked about, socked in, looks great. And then, okay, one attachment. One attachment for her refinement. We take a look here for after. So we're gonna do a little IPR on her lower just to get that midline corrected. I will say people are a little bit more um, uh, forthcoming when it comes to doing a little bit of IPR versus having 20 attachments. Um, I, I find that out with my patients and explaining why we're doing it. Um, you know, and with Angie here, I told her we were doing it for her midline correction. She was ecstatic about that. So um, in the sense that we could correct that for her. And, you know, when people have fan shaped lower incisors, we can do a little bit of IPR there. This one I want to show you on Rosie, and we're going to be done with the easy cases here at this point, and we're going to go into some harder cases. So with Rosie here, the one reason I want to show you this here is that look at how many porcelain fused metal crowns this woman has, and she wanted to have her teeth straight. You know, she didn't like her narrow arches, didn't like her alignment. Go we'll look at before and after here. You know, this is what we're going to provide for her. So here she is four months. And the reason why it was only four months is we, we I've only had two patients where we, where we lost some tracking and, and Rosie was one of them. But look at the space that was created here on the upper incisors. And that's really where we lost that tracking was between those upper ones. So when we look at that right there, when we look at that, that's where we kind of started losing that. But look at how much alignment we're getting already and how much uprighting in the posterior segment that we're getting. And look at all those crowns. So no attachments on this on this case. Look at the posterior occlusion, socked in there very, very nicely. And look at how we're utilizing that buckle bone support again, like we talked about. And we're really gonna work on getting those premolars expanded. Look at the lower alignment that's occurring. And then we take a look at before, after. So I asked for a couple of attachments on the threes just to get a little bit more uprighting and to help a little bit with that deep bite correction. But she's loving it. You know, she's going to be done. You know, she's only been in them for, like I said, four months. You know, we're probably looking at another six. She'll probably be done in about 10 months. She's great. She's a um, she's real estate, into real estate. And, and she loves these aligners because, you know, we don't have 20 attachments. So one um, final case here. Um, and we're going to take a look here at Dwayne. Dwayne's an interesting case because when we look at him, he's got some pretty severe crowding on the lower arch. He's got some upright um, of the upper incisors, but he's got great, great bone support, especially in the in the four or five region. Obviously, we got that posterior crossbite um, and, and a little bit of a midline discrepancy. Dwayne's case really interested me because one thing you'll see in a lot of your adult patients, you have a very long clinical crown. When you have those long clinical crowns, a lot of times you don't need attachments with the SLX aligners. So his case really interested me because when we look at the before and after, you'll see there's no attachments on this case. Um, so it was a really great case. Um, did get Dwayne's aligners to him before we had this COVID shutdown. So I'm really excited to see him when he gets back here since we've been out of the office for um, almost eight weeks now. So, but I'm just really, really impressed um, with the lab setup, with the technicians, how they set this case up. Um, now, obviously, we're going to need a, to do a little IPR on him, um, and we did, but look at the expansion we're getting in the premolar area. We're going to really work on uprighting these teeth. Um, look at the midline correction. Look how the teeth are moving here. So you can kind of see aligners do a great job of getting that bite jumped, um, like you see there. Teeth are moving there, so you can see that. So doing a really, really great job there. So I'm really excited to see his case. Now we're going to jump to, um, I'm going to go through these a little quick. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about mechanics when it comes to motion. Um, and then, like I said, in the Q&A, if anybody has any questions on that, we'll talk about motion mechanics. Um, so when we talk a little bit about the biomechanics with the motion, what we're really looking at is when we look at cases that have um, you know, excessive overbite, rotations, um, mesial rotated molars. That's why I always look at now when I do my exams. I'll look at are the molars rotated? Um, is the patient class two or class three? Do we have crowding? All those things I'm looking at. So after we're done with the motion, we're gonna get that translation of the canines and the 
premolar is moving distally. We're going to get an uprighting um, and a rotation of the molar. And then you can kind of see we're going to get some increased spacing where we had crowding and sometimes spontaneous alignment, sometimes spontaneous torque correction. We have teeth that are retroclined, well, they'll be upright. And then you'll take a very hard case and make it very easy and make it an aligner case. In my office, every case is an aligner case as long as we get the AP corrected. So we'll talk a little bit about that and get that sagittal correction. So when we look at a case that's a full step class two molar like this, full step class two canine, in our office, what we'll do is we'll start off with a force one elastic, which is a quarter inch, six ounce elastic. Um, and I always recommend using the Carrier elastics when you're using the Carrier appliance. They, it's all proprietary, so they, their elastics are totally different than what you have in your office. We will do that for six weeks. We'll have the patient change their rubber bands um, at least four times a day. So I always say after every major meal and right before bed. So breakfast, lunch, dinner, and right before bed. In six weeks, if they're wearing them well, you will see bike correction occurring. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll just keep going. We'll go from a force one to a force two elastic. Force two elastic is a three sixteenths um, qu uh, quarter inch, three sixteenths quarter inch, eight ounce elastic. Same protocol, change it four times a day. And usually within two appointments, you'll see that correction on the right if the patient's wearing it. And what we basically say, full-time wear, 18, 20 hours a day, um, you'll get that correction. Adult patients, I do a little bit differently. On an adult patient, I basically will always go from the three to the six. I know a lot of people like to use these shorties. I just feel like if you go from a three to the six, you'll get more of a horizontal vector, you'll get more of a pull. And I always like to go to the sevens if they're present. Um, adults, I will always have them change it about every two hours. So a little bit more frequently. I don't think you need to double up with rubber bands. Um, sometimes it's hard, especially if it's a clear to hit, to put two rubber bands on that hook, but frequency is everything. So if you get these adult patients that are constantly changing them, um, you'll get that bite correction occurring a lot faster. So if we take a look at the um, upper occlusal here, you kind of see what we're talking about here. And the reason why I like to call it the 3D motion appliance, and I've talked to Dr. Carrier about this, but for me, you get correction in all three planes of space. So you get the creation of the, um, the areas where you had crowding, where you have proclined incisors. Now you create space that you can upright those teeth. But you, you correct the, sometimes if you have some transverse issues or you have teeth that are tipped in towards the palate, you get that kind of that uprighting, that expansion. Um, you get overbite correction. So a lot of times on the vertical aspect, you'll get nice overbite correction. You have a case that was initially very deep. Now you have a case that's actually um, an, an ideal overbite, and you'll see some cases like that. But that's really why I believe it's the 3D motion appliance, because you're really correcting all three planes of space with this appliance. So we're going to go into Dylan's case here. Really tough class three. Um, patient had, you can kind of see, had orthodontic treatment. Um, in the past and uh, don't know if he grew out of that correction, but more than likely he probably did. Um, that's another thing too. We can look at the CVM um, cervical vertebrae analysis and determine where the patients are in their growth spurt. So if we know that Dylan's not gonna grow much anymore and that was kind of determined at this point, he was willing to go through um, a class three motion appliance. So when we take a look at that, when we're going class three motion, we are literally trying to get that lower canine to touch the upper canine. We want to go a little bit more almost to a class two molar canine relationship or an end on class two canine. So we want that lower canine touching. You can kind of see you'll get some extrusion on those lower threes. It's okay. We want to see that because we're going to change the occlusal planes when it comes to these class threes. So when we take a look at his case here, I'm going to show you a little bit about the Studio Pro on his case, but really, really nice case. And we were able to get that in about five months, but we're going to spend a little bit of time here just on the Studio Pro here. So we kind of see here, we're going to go before, after. So this is the time when you're asking, you know, when would you ask for um, attachments? So any type of extrusion movement, we will probably have an attachment on there. Any type of intrusion movement, we'll usually will have attachment. And then anything that requires, I would say, more than... 30 degrees, 35 degrees of rotation. Sometimes the technician will put an attachment there as well, but not on every tooth, right? I mean, you take a look here. We've got um, we've got some attachments on lower threes, lower sixes. On the upper, obviously, we want to close that bite down. 
So we have some extrusion attachments there, and then we have some cutout slits, some slits for uh, elastics. And usually when I get these cases back, um, we might have to go into an elastic at nighttime. So it's nice to have those slits, but you can kind of see how the teeth are moving here. And you can kind of see how much space we created. You'll see that, look how much space we created with that class three motion appliance. Wonderful job of, of getting that space created, getting that class three correction there. And then we're going to show you here. I, mean, I really want to use Dylan's case to show you all the features in Studio Pro. You can do super impositioning of the teeth, see how the teeth are moving. Now we're getting some expansion to his case on the upper, getting some uprighting of those lower teeth. And then you'll see we'll do some so you kind of see the super positioning there and then we're going to go into <clears throat> now i accepted the case but we're going to let's say we're going to do some modifications so if we want to we can grab onto the attachment here we can move the attachment if we need to i don't do a lot of that um, i'll be honest with you i really um, trust the technicians when it comes to the studio pro they do a wonderful job on setting teeth up if I'm going to do any modification, I will usually maybe do that um, on a refinement stage. Um, a lot of times I, I really I really like the way the technicians set the cases up. But you have the capability of, of clicking on teeth. Um, right here, we're going to translate the tooth. Let's say I wanted to extrude the tooth more. It's going to show you here. We're going to kind of go through that. Basically, click on the tooth. I drag it down. You can kind of see on the lower right area, the Y axis, it's showing you how much the tooth is moving in millimeters. So we're able to click on the teeth, make sure we're moving them all at the same time, you know, same directions there. And this is the area where, um, like I said, if you, if you need to do any of this, you can translate the two three dimensionally. I'm going to kind of show you here. Um, we're going to go through all three planes of space here, but you can literally pull the teeth down. If you need to do some intrusion, you can do the same thing. But just kind of showing you how much that tooth is moving down. And, and like I said, we're going to move into, um, I'm going to try to give you like a rotational movement here. We'll kind of show you. So we're going to go to rotate. Um, so like I say, you can rotate all three planes of space. So if we just need to do a mesial distal rotation, we can do that. Just like you're seeing here. Mesial distal rotation. And we're going to see here. So we're going to kind of move into, let's say we want to torque the tooth. So you can kind of see, we're going to show you a better image here. Let's say we want to torque the tooth so we can, we can torque the tooth out three dimensionally there. And then we can kind of show you if we wanted to actually tip the tooth. So Say we wanted uh, tooth had too much uh, mesial root tip. Let's say we want to add some or mesial, yeah, distal root tip. We had a mesial, and then we had distal root tip. So we're able to do all those features. Um, like I said, I I don't do a lot of movement of the teeth in the Studio Pro. I, I let the technician set them up. Um, if I if I look at a tooth um, once we get done with that initial phase, I feel like it needs a little bit more rotation, a little bit more torque. I'll mention that to the technician on my refinement. And then if I see that I want to get a little bit more, maybe a little overcorrection, um, maybe I'll grab the tooth and do that. So we're going to get through some more cases here. Oscar, another class three, um, basically uh, full-time wear with class three motion. Usually with the class three motion, I'll only have them wear force one elastic. Force two is a little bit too strong on a class three. But here he is, five months. Um, what we do is once we get the, the AP or the sagittal correction done, what we do in our office, we will remove um, the motion appliance on the lower arch, uh, we'll clean the glue up, we'll keep the sidekick on, we'll take a scan, we'll update photos, we'll submit that case. Um, and then that way we were able to get a really nice fitting aligner when it comes back. What we'll do that day is we'll either do a, um, 
uh, same day uh, lower Essex retainer, um, whether we do an alginate or whether we um, do a scan, and then we'll deliver it to that patient. They're used to wearing their upper um, uh, retainer for the SL or for the um, motion treatment, so we'll just have them wear a low retainer until we get their aligners back. Sometimes I'll put them on a very light elastic, but I found that I really don't have to do that as long as I overcorrect. And overcorrecting is key, whether it's class two or class three, you really want to overcorrect these cases. So I'm going to move through these a little bit faster just because we're getting a little bit short on time. But you kind of see we've got some extrusion attachments to close that bite down. But once you get the AP, once you get the case sagitally corrected, you know, it makes the case so much easier when it comes to the aligners. Um, Evelyn, similar thing. We got an anterior crossbite there. We've got a class three. Um, she's got very narrow arches, and obviously it doesn't like her upper um, incisors. She feels like they're proclined. I would agree with her. So here she is, um, class one platform in um, in four months. Um, obviously, we've de developed a little bit of an open bite, and you'll get that, and that's that's okay. Because remember, we're changing the occlusal plane here on these class threes. So similar situation. Obviously, we've got some attachments there to help get that bite socked into place. Look how much uprighting we're going to get on those upper incisors. She's going to love that. And the fact that we're going to use that buckle bone support that we talk about, getting those arches round out. This is another assistant of mine, um, Kaylee. So we're going to go into some class two um, corrections here. So Kaylee was unique um, in the sense that she didn't like her lower spacing, didn't like her class two, didn't like her uh, upright incisors. So um, I started her off in lower aligners, and um, I don't recommend that. They're 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 working on that, but but you'll see that it still worked on in her case. Um, but we did actually start her lower alignment, and I basically just gave them the idea that. We were going to maintain her class to um, just the motion was going to get that corrected. And on her, she was pretty darn vain, so we ended up doing a shorty on her. You'll see that here in a second. So we did it from the four to the six. Um, but you can kind of see, even though we started moving her lower teeth, you can kind of see you know, the space started closing very nicely on the lower arch. Um, and we got her into a really nice class one platform in about five months. Um, now we actually have. Um, her, her bite established very nicely. I did want to work a little bit on her overbite, a little bit on her smile arc. So we worked a little bit on getting some intrusion. So you kind of see we've got um, basically some attachments on the upper sixes and the upper threes, but treated out very, very, very nicely here. And of course, I haven't seen any of my team here for the last eight weeks, just with the uh, whole COVID-19 going on. So I'm excited to see her. She says she needs some some more liner so but she's treating out great you can kind of see we're working on getting a little bit more torque in the anterior there um very difficult case here i have these all the time um so you get you know a full step class two molar full step class two canine and these cases come in and, and uh, mom went through aligners and and little ava here was like you know dr Shark, i want i want aligners too and i'm like oh my goodness like Okay, let's see what we can do. You got to wear this rubber band appliance, you know. So we talked about, you know, the, the importance of the motion appliance. And that's a great selling point in your office, too. If you, if you find out, like, you're trying to figure out if a patient's going to be compliant, this is a great way to demonstrate to the parent that if the patient is doing a great job and getting their bike corrected, they're going to be a great aligner patient as well. So we take a look at here. Here she is, six months into treatment, um, you know, full step class two molar and canine. I want that upper canine touching the lower four. That's what I'm talking about overcorrection. Now, obviously, she was in force one and force two elastics to get that correction. But here she is. Look at that beautiful correction. Her profile, she's got great lip support now. And now she's got enough room for that aligner to grab a hold of and really start working on lining those teeth up. So here's her case. Still, you know, this is a case that uh, obviously was supposed to come in here. Um, with this whole COVID thing. So she, I can't wait for her to come in because I think she's on a liner and leave. 
I think she's on a liner eight or a 10 right now. So I'm really excited to see how her case is looking. But you can kind of see um, you know, the before and after here, we're looking at one attachment on this case. So, so that to me is just amazing when you have a case like this that you're able to incorporate the plastic over the teeth, incorporate that interproximal contact, that gingival embrasure, and getting more of that surface area to, to really grab a hold of those teeth. Here's another one here, Lauren, very similar case. If you take a look here, um, you know, and we've got that class two corrected, and now, now it's made it into a very, very easy case. Upper incisors have uprighted. Here's her case. So you kind of see we've got some extrusion attachments on the on the upper um, two to two just for some smile arc um, correction there and upper sevens to get some torque on those. Another case here, Aaron. He's fairly class one, but I didn't like his procline incisors and I didn't like the overbite. So I, I and I didn't like his profile. So we worked on that. Um, he overcorrected very nicely. Six six you know six months there. Um, you kind of see where those sixes are. So um, great job on wearing the appliance. Now we have room to really upright those incisors. Um, Kira, who I just saw right before the COVID thing. This is another case. I wanted to show this case because it's very important to look at cases like this and still say that this is an aligner case as long as you get the class two corrected and create enough space for the upper threes. So with Kira, she's got a class two profile. Here we are seven months later. And seven, oh, well, the reason why I was seven months is I just wanted the canines to come in. But you look at her bite correction, look at her profile correction. Um, look how easy we made this case. Really hard case that we made easy. And if we take a look at her case, you'll see before and after, we're gonna get a couple of attachments just to get some bite closure. Um, you kind of see the four is a little higher. We're gonna close that down. And here on the left side, you can kind of see right there, we're gonna get some attachments there just to get that bite closed down. Jackie, um, another adult, uh, you know, case here. And like we said on these adult cases, lots of porcelain infused metal crowns. Um, she's class two, she didn't like her overbite. You know, they always call it overbite, but really her overjet. So when we look at that, you know, six months of treatment here, and this woman did a wonderful job of wearing her um, motion appliance. Um, sometimes it's a little tough on these crowns. Uh, sometimes you'll get some breakage, but boy, it's worth it because you look at her now, and we got a nice overbite correction. Her, you know, her overjet is gone. But the one thing that I really love about her case, you'll see here, is basically no attachments. <laughs> I mean, no attachments. All those posterior, you know, post porcelain infused and metal crowns, all that porcelain, we're not going to have to bond anything to it. And uh, she um, is getting ready to get her aligners, um, hopefully here in the next week or two when we open back up. So. Um, but super happy, um, you know, she had a twin block appliance, uh, years ago as an adult. And, uh, you know, I think she's really amazed at the things that we were able to do for her, um, with the motion appliance in combination with the SLX liners. Yeah, you know, a little IPR that's going to be, that's going to, we're going to need to do. We got the slits and the cutouts just, just in case we need the class twos. So I'm going to go through this case a little quick. This is the last case I have. Um, and this is really one of the reasons why I started using the motion appliance um, in combination with aligners. Um, I was not getting any AP correction with uh, any of my aligner cases. And I started to uh, use this case. And this is a case that we saw a little bit earlier. So this is Josephine here, um, you know, class three, um, anterior, posterior, you know, open bite, midline off. Obviously had orthodontic treatment before. We can take a look at the class three and look at the cross bite there. Look at the proclining of the upper and lower incisors. So this is where she was. Four months, she heads off to Taiwan, has a bunch of rubber bands and instructor to wear it. She comes back in the office four months and this is what we see. So um, absolutely, I, I, I have never been um, more impressed with, with an appliance when, when this walked into my office to see the bite correction that we got with her. 
um, just amazed. Um, you look at how, you know, we're just get, almost getting spontaneous uprighting of those lower incisors. Um, obviously, you can kind of see the class three correcting very nicely. I mean, look at the lower incisors, how much uprighting we're getting there. And I wanted to show you, a um, reason why I'm showing you this ClinCheck and we're going to show you here, we're going to go through these a little bit quicker, but what I want to show you here is look at, we've got 36 liners there. And 36 liners, and we're going to take a look at how many attachments are going to be on these teeth. Okay? So we basically have an attachment from upper first molar to upper first molar. And we get her back, this is what we get. So we're getting some bite closure, we're getting some alignment of those teeth. We still have a ways to go on that smile arc. We really need to work on getting those teeth to extrude. Lower teeth are uprighting. Aligners do a wonderful job of taking procline teeth and uprighting them. So here she is. Lining up nicely. Here's another clin check. So we got 24 more aligners. Look at all those attachments on every tooth. Because like we talked about, if you have an appliance that doesn't incorporate any of the uh, soft tissue and doesn't capture all the hard tissue, you need attachments to get these movements to occur. And you have to always over-engineer with this product. So here she is. So overall treatment, we're in 18 months, 14 months of aligners. Things are lining up nicely. Bites looking good. Class three is correcting really nicely here. Lower incisors are uprighting great. I mean, I love that about aligners. Aligners do a wonderful job of uprighting the teeth. Here she is. So just a little recap, we're gonna show that's where she started. This is where she was post motion here. So here she is now. Um, so we've got 20 months of aligners, four months of motion, so two years of treatment. So we're in you know, approximately two years of treatment. Another clinch check here, so another 21 aligners. You know, there we go, right? We've got an attachment on every tooth on the upper. We took some off on the lower. That's the other thing, too, about the SLX aligners. You don't have to remove the attachments when you send a refinement if you need more aligners. Yeah, I just leave them on the... Uh, I just leave them on the scan unless I don't need them. Um, then we can remove them. But every time you, you bring a patient back, you're having to take attachments off, put more attachments on. And after this pro post COVID thing, that's going to be a huge thing. If you have people who are heavily into um, Invisalign and have an attachment on every two, they're going to have to figure out how to deal with, with getting all that glue off. So here we are, here she's finished 28 months of total treatment, 24 months of aligners, you know, I mean, she's very happy, you know, things look great, but what's the problem? You know, it took me 83 aligners to get to get here. Now, the reason why I wanted to show you this case is when we look at what we did on her, we definitely changed her occlusal plane. We definitely got her lips balanced. I definitely improved her profile. and We didn't have to do surgery on her. So she was super happy. But this is a case I told you that I submitted when we looked at how to submit a case. And I wanted to show you this case because this is Josephine with SLX aligners. So if we take a look at the case and we look at the before and after, you know, when we look at it, we've got some attachments, but not on every tooth, an attachment on the upper seven and then on the upper three to three. And we've got a few on the lower incisors. The biggest thing that I love here is that we're incorporating everything that I wanted. We're getting the expansion, we're getting the alignment, we're getting the uprighting of the incisors. Um, and when we look at here, Take a look at where those incisors are. We're getting those uprighting. We're getting that expansion. But I love the fact that it's 28 aligners. Now, will I need a refinement? Yeah, sure, I probably would. But it's definitely not going to be 83 aligners, and it's not going to be an attachment on every tooth. Uh, so I really wanted to kind of show you, you know, as far as the SLX aligners, just what we can do um, uh, on some of these very, very difficult cases when it comes to incorporating um, sagittal first. You know, the carry in motion with SLX aligners, and we always talk about uh, better together, right? I mean, we really are being able to take very hard cases and getting getting them lined up. So this is my wonderful wife. I'm going to end the presentation here just in a couple of slides, but um, I'm really excited to get back to traveling again. <laughs> Something I truly enjoy. This is uh, Marilyn and my uh, and myself and Bora Bora on our 20 year anniversary. Um, and then here we are with my kids who don't look anything like this, but this was Rome a couple years ago. Uh, love traveling, love exploring. 
um, love sharing um, my information. And um, this is the last slide in the presentation, but I just wanted to thank everybody. Um, um, hope I um, inspired you to, to take a look at the uh, the SLX aligners and the motion appliance. I always say um, any, any malocclusions um, can be corrected in combination um, when you were using the motion appliance with the aligners, like we talked about before, better together. If you have any questions, I know we're gonna have a question and answer period, but if I don't get to your question, this is my personal email address. I'm very good about getting back to you, but it's toothtwist at comcast.net. And I'd like to end the presentation uh, by that. Marie's gonna talk to you guys a little bit about some things, but um, thank you so much um, for, for you know, spending an hour and a half with me <laughs> talking about um, SLX clear aligners and, uh, and the benefits of, of using SLX um, aligners. Thank you, Dr. Chorak. Um, it's time for Q&A now, and any questions that we cannot answer now due to any time constraints, we will respond directly to the attendee via email. The first question is, um, can I use other elastics for carrier? And what is the difference between Force 1 and Force 2? Am I allowed to use other brands of elastics? Yeah, um, I would recommend not using other elastics. Um, and this is just what I've learned from Dr. Carrier. Um, I just, I, there's a proprietary um, way that they make the elastics for the appliance. So I would always use um, the Force 1 and Force 2 elastics um, with the motion appliance. When you look at some of those bike corrections that I showed, I mean, those are all, um, those are all carry elastics. The Force 1 is basically it's a quarter inch six ounce elastic and that's the one we usually will start with. Um, the other um, force two is a three sixteenths um, inch eight ounce elastic. Um, and, and I usually will follow that up on the class two cases. I'll usually follow that up on the second appointment. On the class three cases, I usually will only do a force one. I don't wanna overtax the, uh, um, the TMJ joint and, and the disc in that area. So usually, um, it's more of a freq frequency thing with the class three. Um, if we're not seeing that correction, um, usually it's just changing the rubber band a little bit more frequently rather than doubling up the force or putting it too heavy of a force for the class three correction. And the next question is, do you remove the wisdom teeth when distalizing with carrier? On a class three, I, I always try to get the wisdom teeth removed, yes. Um, on Dylan's case there, um, we did have his wisdom teeth removed prior to treatment. Um, on, a on the upper, um, it's not as important um, to get the wisdom teeth removed. So on a class two correction, um, not, not as important to get the wisdom teeth removed. But on a class three, I would say yes. I always try to get, I always try to get the wisdom teeth out. Do you scan with the motion appliance on? No. So what or we do? do you it? Yes. So what we do is um, what we do is we will take the motion appliance off, and then we will do our scan, and then at that same appointment we'll either do a quick impression for a lower Essex retainer, or we'll use that scan and have our local lab um, produce um, a couple of lower Essex retainers to hold the patient in place until we get the SLX liners back from the lab. On the average, how many refinements do you see with SLX? Do you see many refinements with SLX? So what we have been tracking in our office um, out of the 130 cases that we have ongoing, I'm usually doing one refinement. That's it per case. So, so a lot of times um, if we don't get it, and that's the one thing that's amazing about the SLX aligners, it's a laser precision focus that they're really trying to hit that that perfect mark the very first time versus a scattering effect that, that sometimes you see with other aligner companies. Like in this line, you'll get maybe 50% or 70% with that first set of aligners. And then you have an additional set that you get a little bit closer and a little bit closer. Um, like I said, the technicians at, at Henry Shine Orthodox do a wonderful job of trying to get that set up, that case review perfect for you that first time. And um, how do you solve lateral open bar issues with SLX? Well, that's the beautiful thing. Um, 
<laughs> very rarely do I get a lateral open bite with SLX aligners. That's why I love it. Um, you know, when I was a platinum provider with Invisalign and I was using a ton of Invisalign, that was the one thing that frustrated me the most is anytime you got it, anytime you asked for expansion, you would get tipping of the teeth. So the teeth would tip out. And the, because of that, because the aligner material wasn't going all the way over the tooth, and you weren't getting that, that what we're talking about, that thermoforming process, that gap tolerance between the aligner and the tooth, you would get these open bites. And the thing for me was when I started seeing these open bites, I'd be like, oh, gosh, we just added another six months, four to six months of treatment to close the bite down. I don't see a lot of lateral open bites um, with the SLX clear aligners. And that's the beautiful thing. If I'm, if I'm asking for a torque, if I have an upper seven that might be buckly flared, I'll say I want to bring that tooth in occlusion and then they'll place a, um, you know, a uh, horizontally gingerly beveled attachment on that tooth to bring that tooth in place. But I don't get the spontaneous lateral open bites with the SLX aligners. Thank you. Um, can we use SLX clear aligners on extraction cases? Yes, you can. I haven't done any yet, um, but you can. Um, I know there are some doctors that are that have some that are ongoing, um, and and basically you're just going to tell the technician in those areas either have the teeth extracted or tell the technicians which which teeth are going to be extracted, and I believe they will give you a case review. Um, and I don't know if Tiffany uh, Vi is on on the <laughs> she might be able to ask this, but I believe they will give you a case review with those teeth removed and show how the teeth are going to move into those extraction spaces. Okay, the next question is really in relation to one of your cases. For the first case that you shared, um, the patient had fixed retainers at lower three to three. Will SLX retainers overlay that fixed retainer or do we have to order a new retainer? So what I usually do on those, I will remove, I will relieve the area. I'll use the retainer, but I'll just relieve um, in, incisally where the bar is um, to allow the retainer to fit over there. Um, obviously, I think you would have to do a new scan and then submit um, for a new retainer, but that could be a production question um, for uh, for the people at uh, at SLX. But what I usually will do is I will, I will literally just relieve um, with a polishing wheel I'll relieve the retainer in that area and uh, and then just polish it back so it's smooth for the patient. And they, they seem to do fine with that. Um, obviously, if they lost one or um, if one broke or something like that, we could always do a scan and send that back. And I believe that they could block it out at that point in time. Um, another question. Can I use SLX for patients with periodontal disease? Who developed spacings? Do you have any experience with um, patients with periodontal disease who want us to do aligners? Yeah, I've had patients who have uh, very long clinical crowns and have had some bone loss in that area. Um, sometimes, um, you know, we're here in Seattle, we have a, um, you know, po population wise, but sometimes we have people who have some bone loss. Um, what I usually will say is, is it's just important to make sure that when you're trying in the first aligner, um, just to make sure it doesn't lock up underneath the teeth on people who have bone loss. So sometimes we have to modify the gingival margin a little bit on those periodontal patients, but obviously we wanna make sure they don't have any active periodontal disease. So if they've had some bone loss in the area, but they're, you know, they're being monitored by, by periodontists, um, there's no active periodontal disease, um, and we wanna just kinda basically delineate where we want that margin to to lay on the teeth that absolutely yeah you can use this on people who have bone loss and and who may have had periodontal disease in the past um, to move the teeth that might be where you may be um, default to a lower velocity setting um, you know when we're doing the uh, submitting the case and we're able to show that that we can actually say you know what patient had prior periodontal disease we might want to move a little slower on this case um, so the technicians know that the velocity of moving the teeth is going to be a little bit less. Um, when you scan for SLX cases using the iTero, do you select iRecord, iCast, or just Invisalign? iRecord, just iRecord, yep. 
yeah. you don't okay. don't select yep it's just i record and it will uh it will auto populate into that um myitero.com on on the on the um on your my itero site so it will go in there and then yeah you know so it's just i record mm -hmm. um the next question is how do you correct anterior edge to edge bite with slx how do you correct anterior edge to edge bite with slx so if it's an anterior edge to edge, um, so if we have like a class three, if there's a class three, so my biggest thing is that at, uh, if I have a class two or a class three um, case with anything that I do, any any if it's a class two or a class three in my office, whether I'm using um, SLX clear aligners or if, if I'm using SLX um, um, 3D brackets, I always uh, use a motion. I always go with the sagittal first correction in my office, whether it's aligners or whether it's uh, self-legating brackets. So if you have an edge to edge, um, you have to evaluate why why are we edge to edge? Is it because we have an AP discrepancy? Uh, because we have an underlying class three? Um, so I look at that. And then I also take a look at the lower um, incisors. Are the lower incisors proclined? Um, you know, are the upper incisors retrocline? So we're looking at the axial inclination of the incisors too. So so if it's if it's a class one and we still are edge to edge, then we need to kind of take a look at, you know, can we upright the lower incisors? Can we slightly upright the upper incisors to get that edge to edge to be more ideal? Um, if they have fan-shaped lower incisors, can we do a little IPR on the lower arch and upright those teeth? So I, I'll take a look at all those things, but Mainly, I'm looking at you know AP sagittal sagittal first philosophy when it comes to those cases. Have you used SLX or teens with mixed dentition? I've used SLX on usually all cases where they have um, full dentition. I have not used it on any mixed dentition cases um, yet. Um, what I've done on cases though, I've, if they are class two. Um, and they are still in their mixed dentition. They just haven't lost teeth because they have a decrease in their in their e space. Uh, we'll get them started on motion, and a lot of times the case is that maybe the sevens aren't fully erupted. By the time we've corrected their their overjet um, and gotten them to a class one platform, a lot of times those cases have lost uh, the remaining um, primary teeth, and the second molars have erupted. And then we move into um, SLX uh, clear aligners. So have not done any mixed dentitions or, or um, anything like that yet. Um, so many questions that are still coming in. Yeah, that's great. Um, the next one is, hi, doctor. Aside from extruding a tooth, what are the indications or considerations in using attachments? Perfect. Yes, so I thought I mentioned that, but uh, again, when I usually like to place an attachment or ask for attachments, on it, usually any extrusion movement will get a will get an attachment, and they'll usually will get a um, horizontally beveled gingival attachment for extrusion. Anytime we want to do group intrusion, let, let's say we want to do um, let's say we want to intrude lower incisors, I usually I'll, I'll ask. Or the technicians are really good about doing this too. If you ask that you want to get some more intrusion or you're asking for um, for an ideal overbite, a lot of times we'll have an attachment on the lower threes and we'll do some group intrusion two to two. On, and that attachment will usually be a, a horizontally beveled incisal attachment um, for intrusion. And then usually the only other areas that I'll ask for attachment, if I if I have a upper seven that's slightly flared buckly and I want to extrude and actually get a little bit of torque on that tooth as well, same thing, you'll get a horizontally gingerly bevel attachment. Um, and then if you have a rotation, sometimes you'll see some rotation attachments pop up. Um, if you have a rotation that's more than, usually more than about 30 to 35 degrees, you'll see a rotational attachment. Um, and, and, and like you saw some cases there, they were rotated 35, you know, 30 degrees with no, you know, we didn't have an attachment. So a lot of times the technicians are looking at all those things, seeing if that, if that movement's going to need a, need an attachment or not. But most of the extrusion, most of the group intrusion will usually require an attachment. Um, and it usually will be on the tooth, 
um, distal to the teeth that you want to intrude. So like on the lower threes, we put attachment on the lower threes to get some group intrusion um, lower two to two. Same thing on the upper. If you have, uh, let's say you have a uh, gingival, excessive gingival display, let's say you have um, incisors that have over erupted um, and, and you want to get some intrusion of the upper incisors to kind of reestablish that smile art, help with that gingival display, um, sometimes you'll get uh, a couple attachments on the upper threes for that as well. Okay, back to the question on the periodontal disease. Um, if the patient has a long clinical crown due to periodontal tissue loss, do you adjust the liner margins yourself to prevent lock-in, or will the SLX technician do it? So if you have a, if, like if you have a root exposure on the tooth, um, I would basically explain to them. Usually the, the technicians will do a very good job on those cases. I would explain maybe just in your notes section and just mention that. Um, hey, you know, a patient has had some previous um, periodontal disease. Um, note that we have a little bit of um, root exposed in these areas. Um, make sure that we're trimming just to that gingival height and not including the root. So I think giving them a little bit of information will help, but more than likely, um, you're not going to have to manually adjust every aligner. The one area that I always will watch for on patients is if you have a high frenal attachment, if you have a frenum that's attaching very high on the gingival tissue, you might wanna mention that to the technician or on the um, behind the central incisors, if you have a very pronounced um, incisive foramen in that area, you may just wanna mention that to the technician just so they can relieve that area and it doesn't pinch the patient. But those are just some of the areas with the frenums and then and, and, and incisive papilla there. Those are the areas that I usually will concentrate on. But most of the time, if you have somebody who's had some bone loss, who has maybe has some root showing, they're not going to they're not going to extend the aligner up in that area. Um, they they know how much purchase point um, you need uh, to capture the tooth to get the movements you want. And they're not going to add more in there. Um, so, like I said, most of the time technicians are going to pick that up. But it's always nice to give them a little bit of information too, just so everybody's on the same page. Are there pontics in aligners if making space for a missing lateral? Yeah, um, yes, I believe they are in the process of doing that, and I think it's I think it's almost finalized. So I think that that um, they are working on that. I know that for sure. I know I, last time I talked to Tiffany, by um, she mentioned that that um, they are getting to get the software to to, to get that showing. I believe. Okay, we have a very interesting question. What will you do if you accidentally overcorrect a class three case to a full class two with carry motion? I will be very happy. <laughs> um, you're always going to get a little bit of bounce with these bikes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yes, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you look at some of the cases there. I mean, that you really have to almost take that that lower canine and get it to be almost class two end on canine. I mean, that's what I'm shooting for on every patient, every class three I'm shooting for, because I know that if I get them in an SX retainer and we get a little bit of a bounce to their occlusion, um, that they're gonna bounce right back into a class one platform. So the biggest mistake I see with doctors that are using the motion appliance is that they do not overcorrect. They, they get into a class one platform and they feel like, Okay, I'm I'm done, and and I've you know everything that I'm showing, everything that I'm that I'm that I that I'm sharing. I mean, I learned from you know my teacher, you know Dr. Carrier, who you know is is amazing when it comes to you know uh, um, showing how this appliance works, and um, and he's always told me to overcorrect, 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 just like if you were doing class two or class three elastics with your with your you know your braces cases, right? You're you're going to overcorrect. You're going to overcorrect. You're going to slowly take them off the rubber bands. That's one thing I didn't mention. You know, a lot of times when I get overcorrection, then I'll slowly start to take the patient off the elastics. So, so we're full time. We're full time, and then maybe we're only wearing them two thirds of the day for an appointment. And then maybe the next time they come back, they're still overcorrected. And maybe we're, we're wearing it maybe just at night for an appointment. So for me, I like to slowly take them off the elastics. 
and to make sure that we have that bite in that perfect position. And if we do get a little bit of relapse, it's a little bit of relapse relapsing into that nice class one platform. Okay, we will take our last two questions. Um, do you order the free set of retainers when the case is finished? Or does it automatically does it come automatically after the first round of treatment? Yeah, it automatically comes after the first round of treatment. And I believe Tiffany um, has was explaining that if you do a refinement, I believe that also comes with the refinement as well at the end of treatment. So so I believe you get a retainer set each time you submit the case. I believe that's the case. But obviously, there's um, there's emails there that you can contact Henry Shine. Um, I don't want to you know speak on something I'm not fully aware of, but I believe that that yes, you you, you will get a, a set of retainers at a, at each um, at each end at the end of each treatment. Um, okay, I think we will take our last question for tonight. Um, based on your experience, in which case do you need braces instead of aligners after the first round of treatment? So for me, um, in my office, and just because I've done enough aligner treatment, and uh, especially with the SLX aligners, um, to me, I don't ever want anybody to feel like they're not in an aligner case. And I've said this before in, in, in presentations that I've given, as long as compliance is not an issue and as long as I get their bites corrected before a liner treatment if I can do those two things if I can show that that they can wear their rubber bands they can wear their motion appliance that that they they they're good about um, from a from a compliance standpoint they're good about getting their bite corrected then I believe any case is an aligner case I really firmly firmly believe that as long as we can get the transverse the vertical and the AP corrected with the motion appliance. Um, I, I believe any case is an aligner case. Now, sometimes, you know, if you have, okay, you say, well, Dr. Chark, is that true? But sometimes we need to use auxiliaries. I mean, I have a case that I didn't show in today's presentation, but I had a case today who was an adolescent um, child who has a unilateral, a true skeletal unilateral crossbite. Um, so I basically explained to the mom and the dad that we needed to do some expansion on her to get her out of crossbite. But once we got her out of crossbite, she's in a liner case. And that's exactly what we did. We, we got her in a unilateral RPE, uh, got the bike jumped, um, took the expander out, submitted her to SLX liners, and she is getting ready to, to go into liners when we get back from this whole COVID thing. So, so as long as you can get things in the right relationship, for me, anybody's in a liner case versus a versus a bracket case. For me, it's all about it's all about compliance. It's and finding having those discussions, having those one-on-one -on -one discussions with the parents and the patients, and explaining what's needed of them um, to get the results we want. Um, sometimes those are real hard conversations to have, but you have to have them because otherwise um, you're not going to be successful. But I truly believe every case is an aligner case if we get the bike correction first. Okay, we still have one more minute left. So I'm just going to add in one last question. Uh, may I know why the lower canines will extrude about 2 to 3 mm after three months of carrier motion class 3 cor correction? Why does that occur? Is that the question or why? Yes, correct. So, so why does the lower canines extrude about two to three mm? So it all depends on what you want to achieve with the lower canines extruding. So if you have a, let's say you have a class three, like if we look at Josephine's case, if you have a class three with an anterior open bite, what do we need to do to get that bite to close down? We got to change her occlusal plane. So anytime you need to change the vertical part of, of a patient's occlusion, like an open bite in the anterior, then we're gonna want to go from the lower sixes to lower threes on a class three. Because we, we need to reestablish, we need to re-level the lower arch, so we're gonna create a little bit more of an open bite in that area. So when we do close a bite down, we, we've now changed the occlusal plane from like here 
to here. So we've, we've literally leveled that occlusal plane out. Now, if we don't want that to occur, let's say we like where the occlusal plane is, but the patient is more of a uh, class three, um, maybe a CRCO shift, um, and, we, and we don't want to change that, then that might be an area where you actually go from the lower six to the lower four. So you don't get so you don't get that extrusion of the lower three. So it all depends on what you're trying to do um, uh, to get to get that occlusal plane change. So if you don't need the occlusal plane to change, um, but you do have a class three component, then I would use a shorty on the lower. And uh, if you do want to change the occlusal plane, I, I, I'd use a standard size from the from the three to the six. It's just that you're pulling on that, um, you know, you're pulling on that tooth. You're putting a pretty significant force. You have a pretty significant vector there, so you definitely want to make sure that um, that you're watching those things. I've had a kid who came in six weeks after pulling hard on a Force One Class Three elastic, and mom basically told me her tooth is so loose, Dr. Troy, I can need you to take a look at it. And I was like, oh, no, that's a good thing. And she came in and basically, I couldn't believe it. She She's a full step Class Three molar and can she's a surgical case, but they couldn't afford surgery. She came in, she went from a full cusp class three to a full cusp class two in six weeks. This is how well this girl was wearing her rubber bands. And obviously the lower threes were loose. So I just told her to stop wearing her rubber bands and, and she did and, the, and the, those canines tightened right back up. So, so you gotta watch those class threes cause they will they'll move a little faster. Um, but you do also have to just explain to them that that's normal if, if we want to get that extrusion to occur. Thank you so much, Dr. Chorak. That was some very heavy information for tonight or today for those in other parts of the world other than Asia. Um, just to remind everybody, this webinar is recorded and you can find it at henryshineauthocom slash webinars in a week's time. And we will also follow up with the rest of the questions that we did not manage to answer tonight via email. Thank you everyone for attending our webinar and thank you so much for staying till the end. Stay safe and we hope to see you soon. Yeah, thank you so much.